um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Stacy Hassan, who is a curator at the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism. Once upon a time, I spent a delightful several hours with Stacy, one on one, digging through the files, looking at the pictures, talking about them, playing with the symbols, coming up with the history, talking about dreams. It was incredible. I would like to be an intern. <laughs> um, and we had such a great time. I, um, I, I even went out and looked for other symbols, and I don't know, I sort of got lost in the whole thing. And I'm still using the online uh, service, which is I highly recommend for dream work or writing poetry or anything else that you might want stimulation for. And how does one do that? Uh, oh, Jana. Yeah. I don't know. I, I could. Um, I could send out an email, probably. Oh, yeah. Would you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, with the with the click on thing. Mm -hmm. If you Google ours, A R A S. A -R -A -S. So Stacy became interested in Aris when it was still a secret repository. I mean, this stuff is there's all sorts of good stories going on here. <clears throat> and she learned to use the images in her dream work uh, during analysis. As she says, she became hooked, as did I, and continued to use the archive over the years of her graduate work at Pacifica, where she earned her PhD in mythological studies and depth psychology in 2009. Shortly thereafter, Stacy stepped into the role of curator. I think there was only one before you, right? There were actually a few. Oh, a few, okay. And, uh, and she is in charge of, of the archive. Her dissertation was The Alchemy of Refinding the Light in the World Soul. Mm -hmm. She will be speaking with us today about the catalyst, process, and matter that awaken the individual in the world soul, something I'm sure we all need to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so join me in welcoming Stacy. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Please share off uh, oh, cell phones okay. if you're on. Thank you. That was a lovely time we spent together <laughs> really in the space of the imagination. That was wonderful. I'll never forget it. And so you are welcome to contact me either through the Jung Institute main line. You can call my extensions 214 or you can email me at aris.org. It's on the website as well. So feel free to contact me that way or S-T-A-C-Y. H A S S E N at iCloud.com, and I can give you that information again. But uh, thank you, Steve, also for <laughs> doing the recording on this, and Jana for being influential in having me come. I really appreciate the invitation. And thank you all for taking the time on such a beautiful day to be inside and to contemplate the Adam and Lindy and the alchemical process uh, as a psychological work of transformation. Now first, I would like to um, speak today to something that is more hidden. Um, as, es as alchemy is an esoteric art, and it's also something that's very close to my heart. Um, and I must share with you that I had a talk prepared for today that's a very nice talk. And it's very clear, and it's very safe. It's a very safe talk for me to give. I've given it before. It's had time to gestate and also kind of be refined. But um, it's also something, I just had a feeling come up, like a sense that something else really wanted to be spoken to. And it's, it's not always easy to engage those parts and to pay attention kind of to what's, what's arising and to, to say yes when that comes. But, so I may stumble <laughs> a bit. And if you're there with me, that's part of the journey. But it's also, I was reflecting on Jung's sage wisdom, which relates to the quote on the APC website. Because in alchemy, you really begin with where you are. You start from what's present, what's just there. And I'll speak to this in a moment, but I couldn't go the way of this old talk 
this safe way. So this presentation, as I said, might be imperfect, like the stone of the philosophers, which is the material, the dark matter you need to begin the work. It's, it's the, the stone of the philosophers is the material that most people reject, because it's often difficult to look at that matter, those rejected parts, and to face it. And really, who wants to look? Who wants to look at their own darkness? But that's what alchemy asks us to do. So that's the black lead and stone of alchemy one begins with. And yet, that material is absolutely necessary for the process. You can't start alchemy if you don't have that stone. So this will be kind of a a stepping off into the unknown and something maybe that's really at that heart of creativity where something is forming itself. It's a place of immense energy. It contains the juice, the sap, the chymos of alchemy, which is the life elixir, the life force. It's the poet Theodore Rethi who wrote, we learn by going where we need to go. And it seems to me at this point in time, with things in the world and the state they're in, with human beings treating the earth and each other as something disposable, as a commodity, we need to turn to go in the way of nature, to be close to the earth, to have humility from the word humus or soil, and compassion, which means to suffer with. In essence, we need, and more importantly, the world needs human alchemists who are willing to have the courage, the cuore, the heart, to go where no man or woman has gone before, at least not in the same way, for certainly others have made this journey before us. And yet, the river of life is never the same river twice. It's always moving, flowing, coursing. While I was asking for some inner wisdom about whether to stay with this safe talk or venture into another perspective, I came across the open pages of some of my older writings. And I saw, just it just jumped out at me, this quote that Helen Luke writes, where she tells the story of a woman who is on the shores of a river kind of at that, she needs to find some wisdom within herself. And I guess I'd like to, to take the liberty, just since we're all here together today, to change the she in the quote to, to the we that's, that's here in this room. So Helen Luke, Luke writes of this woman patiently waiting for an inner voice to bring her some wisdom as to the direction she should go as she's standing on the shore of this riverbank. And she says, and the wisdom came only by going down, not by striving upwards, will we find ourselves. We must plunge into the river of life unconditionally, risking mistakes or failure, for it is only by trusting ourselves to the unknown, both in the outer life and in the inner, in our own hidden depths, that we will find our unique way. The goal of alchemy as human alchemists, um, as I see us as, as human alchemists uh, in the world today, is really to redeem the light hidden in nature. And she's been so generous with us. So if you're willing to go on this journey with me, <laughs> sorry, that's part of it. So if you're willing to go on this journey with me today, I hope that we can together follow nature's guidance as she lights our way and perhaps with trust by going where we need to go. Go where we need to go. Okay, all in agreement? Okay, so <laughs> I'll continue. So thank you again for your adventurous spirit <laughs> and for simply saying yes. I think if we're going to do the work necessary to help the planet, we can no longer be timid.
And I think that's part of the reason this talk really wanted to come and be with you. So this is a photograph taken from the perspective of the moon, of the Earth rising 50 years ago. This, is a, this powerful image captured the imaginations and the hearts of the astronauts and nearly all who saw it. The image had the power to shift people's consciousness of the Earth as a living, breathing whole. Uh, it was not the intention of the, the uh, astronauts. They were there to do a job. They were part of the space race. They were you know, in that space race against Russia to, to get up there and to do something, have some technological advancement that was beyond someone else. It was, it was a kind of a competitive impetus that was driving that. But when they got up there and they saw the Earth rising from the perspective, perspective of the moon, they saw home. They saw a living, breathing planet that the people they loved lived on. And there were no divisions. So if we start from that perspective with the Earth, I think something else can come into being. Let's see, where's my mouse? There it is. <laughs> so now therapy comes uh, this was a part, let me see if I can get back, I'm not sure, this is a newer. And as I said, this was 50 years ago, and this happened in 1968, December 1968. I was born just a few months before this, so I really feel like there's some kind of part I have to play in, in connection to this. And I also wanted to acknowledge that today is Rosh Hashanah. So anyone who is celebrating, I wish you la shaha tova. So, and I, I think that's interesting because it's a celebration of the Hebrew New Year, as well as the creation of Adam and Eve, which perhaps, I don't know, I, I feel this is an opportunity for a new consciousness because that's a story that has been living in the Western ideology for a very long time and it's had a very great impact I would say on on our consciousness so excuse me, what did you say it was of Adam and Eve day it's Rosh Hashanah no but but Adam and Eve oh so Adam and Eve it's a celebration of the creation of Adam oh, and the Eve. creation thank you and also the Hebrew New Year so oh, it's a time you. of new beginnings thank you and perhaps if we shift something in the perspective of that or look at it differently, yeah. um, you. something else can come. So as I mentioned before, you with alchemy you begin with where you are. And since we're at the Analytical Psychology Club, I thought I would check out the website and the homepage. And this quote from Carl Jung's letters was there. Hmm? Let's see if I have this on the right. Whoop, I gotta go back. All right, how do we get to this one? Sorry, this is actually a, a new computer of all things. Well, I'll just it's the right quote, talk to you. Okay, yeah, it is the right quote. Well, it comes, it comes from a handwritten response, which I found interesting because it's, it's in a letter he writes to a woman. It's al almost 100 years old. He wrote it on... Um, October 22nd, 1916, to a woman named Fanny Bowditch. And Fanny was requesting to begin therapy with Jung. And it's obvious from the opening of Jung's letter in response that she was in a time of crisis in her life. And, and every crisis is also a time of great opportunity. So Jung writes, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. And First, I'd like to go back and say, well, therapy was, it comes from the Greek language. And in its original meaning, it refers to a healing that's done in service to the gods. It takes us back to the sacred underground temples of Greece in the sixth century and the god Asclepios, known for healing, whose name means to cut open. So interestingly, Asclepios was given the art by some serpents he was kind to. 
because they, in response to his kindness, licked his ears, thereby opening him to the secret wisdom of healing that they naturally understood. And and the secret healing of the secret healing wisdom has a way of restoring balance in the body. You think of the caduceus, the two serpents that entwine a center rod. It's a it's a rebalancing of something. So he served in the temple at Epidaurus, a temenos or contained space set apart from ordinary life, where people would come and stay for an incubation a retreat in the original sense of the word. And they would often have a drink, sometimes with bitter herbs and wine, sometimes something else. But that would help them to sleep. And if they were lucky when they slept, they were given a dream that might have some kind of indication of something that they might need to do in order to find a rebalancing in their body. Or, if they were really lucky, the serpent would show up in their dreams. And that was a very auspicious indication because the serpent was the representative of healing, but it was also the deity to which the temple was devoted. And this relates to Jung because I think for Jung, the therapeutic healing is really done in service to the archetypal presences to the energies that exist at the heart of creation, those primal powers that he said determine the fate of humanity. And in returning to Jung's letter to Fanny, what seems important is also the words he wrote just before the quote I mentioned. And he says, I realize that under the circumstances you have described, you feel the need to see clearly. He goes on, but your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Without, everything seems discordant. Only within does it coalesce into unity. Who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. So the great, excuse me, the great healing wisdom shared is is very relevant to alchemy and the healing of the soul of psyche we need in the world today. For the alchemical process begins in the space of the heart and works on the substance of the soul. So I'd like to begin a little bit with a context for alchemy. Let's see if I can get that clear. Does that help? Um, Though the precise beginnings of alchemy and its texts are unknown, we do know the esoteric art dates to Babylonia, so sometime at least 612 BCE quite old, and Hellenistic Egypt, um, and traveled to various locations such as India, China, Arabia, Greece, and into Europe. The popularity of alchemy diminished for a time, and after the Dark Ages, it celebrated a revival in the 17th century when artists, painters, sculptors, poets, writers again fell in love with the touch of the muses upon their cheek, and Leonardo, Michelangelo, Shakespeare, and others sought to free the light hidden in matter. As the names of things help to reveal specific qualities, I'd like to turn to the meaning of alchemy. The name alchemy suggests a connection to the feminine black earth and the beloved dark goddess Isis. In Arabic, alchemia, from which we get chemistry, means feminine matter of Egypt and comes from Kemenu, land of the moon, which is thought to be the name of the land before it became known as Egypt. Egypt in Greek is Aegyptos and means the river Nile, Egypt. This shows the value of the relationship with the waters of the Nile and the earth for the seasonal flooding of the lands left fertile plains of rich sediment and dark soiled fields in which crops were planted, thus giving life and nourishment to the inhabitants of the area in a region also known for its burning heat and deserts. Alchemy originates from a combination of the Egyptian keme, or kemia, and the Arabic alchimia, that is synonymous with elixir, or the elixir that is the sought for healing medicine produced through alchemy. The Greek word for alchemy, kemeoia, 
relates to the secret essence of life, the kaimos, which is the juice or sap where the lifeblood is. Knowing something of the origins of alchemy's name, we can see a connection to the earth, the ground of being, which as human beings with bodies we can all relate to. Alchemy puts us in contact with the rhythms and the cycles of nature, with the soil of the earth and the water that floods and yet nourishes. Alchemy itself is a confounding collection of images and recipes and texts when you first approach it. It um, includes combinations of soul and luna, sun and moon, and when first Jung approached it, he thought, what nonsense. He didn't see any value in, in the alchemical tradition at that point, yet he couldn't resist the sense of its importance. As some intuition kept tugging at him to return to the Chinese Taoist book, The Secret of the Golden Flower, translated and gifted to him by his friend Richard Wilhelm and other alchemical texts. In returning again and again to the material and staying with the images, which is a very alchemical act of cooking in itself, Jung found what the alchemists were doing was working with the material arising from the unconscious. He saw how in the glass retorts and crucibles, alchemists were projecting the work happening within the psyche out onto the world. In the symbolic images, he was able to discern the journey of the pilgrim soul expressing its own transformation. And then Jung, who like this image of Liu Haichun, the immortal alchemist who holds the imaginal and seemingly otherworldly three-legged moon toad of the feminine principle yin upon his shoulders, while gently holding a peach and branch in his left hand. Um, it was then that, <coughs> that Jung was able to see the inherent likeness to the, his understanding of the psychological process of inner work he called individuation. The alchemists, too, were working on the matter of the psyche. This understanding led him. Ooh, I, let me go back. <laughs> this understanding led him into alchemy with such a passion that it became a major focus of his life's work, upon which he based his magnum opus, *Mysterium Conjunctionis*. Marie Louise von Franz, interestingly enough, before this said that um, Jung saved alchemy from the dung heap. It was surely headed towards, which is which is appropriate for alchemy because as we talked about before, the basic premise of alchemy is that the matter that's common and rejected, unworthy, vile, and debased is the very material which you must find to begin the work. So in the alchemical tradition, it is the stone the builders reject that becomes the stone of the corner or the keystone. Von Franz then shared that before you could buy a good book on alchemy for just a few francs, but when um, alchemy became under the radar of Jung's interest, it drove up the prices in books. So it brought consciousness back, um, it brought alchemy back into consciousness through his awareness of its value. In the words of Jung, the right way to wholeness is made up of fateful detours and wrong turnings. It's a longissima via, not straight, but snake-like. A path that unites the opposites in the manner of the guiding caduceus. A path whose labyrinthine twists and turns are not lacking in terrors. Here we have Mer Mercurius holding the central pole of, um, and the entwining serpents that create, create this healing wand. In alchemy, it is our darkness and not our light that contains the seeds of illumination, a process that is, as Jung identified it, disagreeable and therefore not popular. The initial process is called the negredo, which means black. It's considered a color black that is blacker than black and involves the death of the ego through facing one's inner darkness. The sacrifice required was so that something new may be born. The mystic and teacher Irina Tweedy speaks of the intense suffering of the process when she went to India to meet her teacher. And 
she thought she would get great teachings in yoga. And what her teacher did was to force her to face the darkness within herself, and she said, it nearly killed me. This is the way of soul making called the Royal Road, and it's not for everyone. Rumi warns, it's not for easily broken glass bottle people. <laughs> for it is like Theseus that we must descend into the darkness of the labyrinth of our own psyche, armed with the masculine light of consciousness and the sword of discrimination, to find and face the beast of the Minotaur, half man, half bull, within. We also need Ariadne's gift of the golden thread that's given with love that will lead us safely back. The thread and the light and the sword are all necessary to the process of holding a consciousness so one can move in the unconscious in such a way so as not to get lost and to discover something, perhaps some rejected part that contains a wisdom, an understanding we may bring back from out of the darkness. The labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral in Paris is a beautiful design of geometric proportion and the double spiral mirrors itself in an involution and an evolution that depicts the soul's journey to the center. I like this image because it faces us with, with the entrance to the labyrinth as if we can step into it and imaginally um, engage its geometry and the sacred dimension it invites us to experience within ourselves and its design. And when we've walked the labyrinth, whose name comes from labrys and means womb, we look up and encounter the mandala in stained glass of the rose window, which invites us into an experience of light and color and luminosity. Some of the stained glass was created through an alchemical process and has a particular quality of light. The Gothic artists and architects sought to reflect the harmonies of the sacred order they saw in nature in the building of the cathedrals, and it meant for it, they meant for it to be an experience on the level of the soul. Jung understood how the symbols arising from the unconscious place a great deal of responsibility upon the human being, for in order to realize the particular wisdom they are bringing forth, they must be related to with consciousness and discrimination. And I'd add, from what he shared with Fanny, a third ingredient, a consciousness that comes from the heart. Left untended, unrelated to, these symbols will go back into the unconscious, their energy turning in on itself in a devouring aspect, which is the origin of disease. However, related to with consciousness, this material has a life-giving, harmonizing, renewing aspect that moves one out of this endless cyclical maya beyond the veils of creation. Seeing through the veil of the outer world to the workings of the inner world is visionary. It throws us beyond our intellect and our present understanding of the constructed reality as it takes us into the realm of the soul while silence is becoming more and more scarce, more difficult to experience in our outer life, it is in the inner stillness that we may find an opening in the veil, an opening that carries the fragrance of a distant memory, a mystery that cannot be named, but only experienced as a kind of longing. <laughs> Among the romantic poets are moments out of time, moments of the same longing, in communion and commingling with the beauty of nature. In the words of Wordsworth, I have felt a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of the setting suns and the round ocean and the living air, and the blue sky, and the mind of man.
It was Wordsworth and Keats and Lord Byron who would spend time walking in the woods. And that was their, they had such a love and a longing and for nature and for beauty, they could express it through poetry. That was their task, I would say. Here we have the moon goddess, Ixchel, who with her backstrap loom creates the warp and woof of the fabric of reality. As the bird on the branch of the great tree of life sings, it's the feminine imaginative quality of the soul that gathers the worlds together and weaves the threads of inner and outer, masculine sun and feminine moon, to which she adds the quicksilver of Mercurius, who is both the trickster that stirs up trouble, like my mouse here, it's definitely mercurial today. <laughs> there it is, okay. The quicksilver of Mercurius, who is both the trickster that stirs up trouble and the aphrodisiac that makes us fall in love again with life. It is love that moves us from the head into the heart, into the depths and courage. And it is these great mm. <laughs> depths that nature circulates and binds, and in, the great, in these great depths that nature circulates and binds and unbinds things. Marion Woodman understood how the feminine is meant to be fluid, um, ever transforming, for she does not like to be caught in form. The serpent-haired Medusa, when hidden and out of relationship to life, turns living things into stone. And life is meant to be this constant dance of feminine and masculine in engagement to create the unknown third that evolves things. When the feminine is out of relationship with life, she turns her energy upon herself and others. Importantly, Perseus uses his shield to see her image in reflection and cuts off her head. Again, we see how the masculine sort of discrimination is used to cut that which does not serve life. And by this act, Medusa is transformed as the winged horse, Pegasus, rises from her body to strike his hoof upon the stones of Mount Helicon the home of the muses, and creates the flowing water, the spring, Hippocrene, that nourishes as it inspires poets, musicians, and artists from the aqua permanens and the living water, the aqua vitae, that returns magic to life. In the alchemical process of making gold, the gold of consciousness, creative or active imagination is the method that inspires, brings new breath and water from the living well, whose waters are curative. For creative imagination, entering the unconscious with consciousness and love returns us to the source of nature. I'm not sure how else to say it, but that we, we return to the active life force, united with the longing for what we can never really know. From facing the darkness in ourselves and acknowledging and accepting our angers, our jealousies, our fears, our destructive tendencies, and even our resistances, and even the light parts of ourselves. From projecting those out, um, we gain the gold of understanding that the involution of energies not lived in proper alignment to the soul can create. Um, it's really those energies, when, when we don't recognize what the unconscious is trying to reveal to us, those seeds of illumination, that's an energy that's rising for a purpose. It has an intention, it has a, it has a role to play because it's part of the fabric of creation coming into being. And, as co-creators, human beings are at that place where the unconscious and consciousness meet. They're at the point where things are bridged. And we can, we can help midwife those symbols, those images, into being in a way that honors them. And if we don't, if we don't live in that kind of alignment with the soul and what she's trying to reveal to us, what happens is those energies go back down into the unconscious and they turn on themselves, going inward and create the monsters that we then have to face um, 
and work with through creative imagination. You know, that's the Minotaur at the center of, of the labyrinth. That's an energy that's been uh, frozen in Medusa that uh, is not in service to life. So part of the responsibility of alchemy is going into that darkness, facing those figures, and being in the creative depths of our own psyches, individually first, and realizing that we're responsible for creating some of that material, some of those, those energies. And then what we can do with that is then, by acknowledging them, their existence, accepting that they're there, we can find a way to have some compassion with that part of ourselves and find a way even to bring some, I don't know, I've worked with this material in a way where you take that figure and you wrap it in love and you put it into your heart, and then you ask for help to, to transform it into its highest potential. Mm -hmm. And what you find in life is when you're working with these things, sometimes life really responds, almost immediately in certain cases. And it's not an easy work. It takes a real being with, which is a feminine quality, I think. That's what, um, it's, a, it's a quality that invites a relating to, a communicating, a connecting, and acknowledging something. And that's why it's a work that's spiral. It's in, it goes internal and it also comes out. It's involutionary and evolutionary, like the breath in our bodies. It moves in a very natural flow. And it's not that it's mechanized or automatic. It's not that it, um, you know, nature at a certain point <coughs> was considered inanimate. And a Cartesian ideology put nature into a category and said, nature has no feeling, nature has no life, and so we can do with it what we will. And that's gotten us into the problems that we're in in the world today. Part of the work of, of um, being with the what's happening in the planet is really finding a way to bring that breath and that movement back in. And it involves the imagination. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, whoop, here we go, there's that mercurial mouse again, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's actually, um, You know, some of the greatest life lessons come in that humility, humility, that, that humus, that earth, that ground of being that puts us on our knees and close to the soil of, of the planet that we call home, of the planet that we call mother, of the planet we call earth, Gaia. Not just as a theory, but as a real living, physical, entity. And, and I think this is where alchemy speaks to the process of maturing on the path, where we finally start to take responsibility in a different way for something. And it is an art of transformation. It's metamorphosis. It's a shift in shape, a change of shape. And we have to learn that this true change comes from within ourselves. It's not outside. It's not projected into the world like the alchemists initially were doing with their chemical experiments. It's in the images created out of the unconscious. And it's those images that help us co-create the world, it's through our thoughts, our dreams, our desires, and needs. Um, I would say Jung understood the power of the imagination. 
in connection with the unconscious. In his words, he called it the the imaginatio, as the alchemist understood it. He said that the imaginatio is, in truth, a key that opens the door to the secret of the opus. This image shows the shadow of the feminine earth, which mm. in which we can find the gold. Mm. If we're attentive. And it mm. seems to me, well, this is the part where it gets kind of tricky because there is something that wants to be spoken to and I'm not sure how to go about it. So I will just try and we'll see what happens. It's, um, there was a great Sufi teacher named Hazrat Inayat Khan. I don't know if any of you have probably heard of him. He said, a hundred years ago, I can see as clear as daylight that the hour is coming when women will lead humanity to a higher evolution. Now, I feel those words are really necessary to hear and reflect upon now more than ever. For the work of women is in the everyday. And I think it's in the work of women to see the shadow of the feminine. Mm -hmm. For we are the sacred space that we need to redeem. And I think somehow, as confounding as this part may be, I think it even relates to the fact that today is Rosh Hashanah. I think it returns us to the Garden of Eden. And the fact that at that point in the story, something got solidified. Eve became the one who got us kicked out of the Garden of Eden got us kicked out of paradise. But I also think there's something of Lilith that we're forgetting, who was there in creation before God. This is the divine feminine. The serpent that winds the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if Jung were there in that garden, I wonder if he would take a bite of that apple. Just so he could find a way to experience both. And maybe find a way to bring a sort of balance in a way of holding these two opposites, which is really the work that alchemy seeks, is to find a way to hold the light and the dark. Mm -hmm. The image is the sun and the moon. Find a way to hold the masculine and feminine, the hot and the cold, all these things we think of as opposites. This is yeah. really, in the Garden of Eden, and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, where I think something in the story got the feminine stuck. And I don't think it was meant to be that way. I think if the serpent somehow, or I feel it more so, it's not even an intellectual thing, it's a sense of, you know, I was raised Catholic, so the whole church thing was part of my upbringing in a, in a, in a certain way. But I knew that as a Catholic, I wasn't allowed to have direct contact with the divine. I had to go through a priest because I was a woman. I was female. And that meant that I was connected to Eve, and therefore evil, in a sense, according to the teachings of our church. And um, even what was within the community of people. But what I see on, or what I'm feeling on Rosh Hashanah, is that Maybe this serpent, who in some images and instances is actually crowned, maybe this serpent really relates to a certain feminine energy that was pushing for, offering, not pushing, offering to Eve an opportunity for some new consciousness to come in, saying, here, taste of the fruit of life. Can you do that? Are you willing to see beyond your own constrictions? We can put it in that term. 
Do you know the 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 image of the serpent in the garden spirals up the tree? It's not caught in you know the Ouroboros of alchemy, which is the serpent that bites its own tail and in, infuses a poison that actually becomes the homeopathic remedy. A little bit of the poison is actually the healing medicament. But what I see is that if it was Lilith, let's just say, imaginally speaking, if it was Lilith, a feminine energy, the energy that's really at the heart of creation, essentially, relates to Shakti of the Hindus, um, relates to any other, you know, Astarte, Ishtar, Isis. It relates to all of those feminine goddess energies. If Lilith was trying to bring forth a new consciousness and Eve accepted that and got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it's just a story. We're just musing. Maybe somehow something got stuck. Maybe it's, it's going back to what Marion Woodman says about the feminine doesn't like to be concretized in one shape. She likes to keep moving. Maybe the feminine got stuck in some form of matter or an image or even a strong emotion. Maybe the feminine got caught in the anger of the expulsion from the garden. And matter went from something dynamic and vital and shape-shifting to something that started to turn on itself. And we get materialism instead, which is that involuting of that energy. So I think that alchemy maybe offers a perspective. But let's return to this. And, and if I forget, I'd please remind me. So let's kind of return to the garden of the soul and the feminine, to psyche. For Jung said, psyche is nature. A chemical tree. So again, we're back to trees and gardens. and But now there's a light, a consciousness that's different. This is, we can also return to the words that Jung shared with Fanny. You know, looking into the heart is essential to alchemy. I think that's what keeps things moving. It is that vital organ that circulates that living essence, that blood that nourishes the entire organ of the body. It's an organic happening. And it's constant. We don't have to think about it. It just, ha it just moves. So the heart is the place of divine revelation. It's the alchemical alembic, the well-sealed vessel, the vast beneclosum that contains the tension of the opposites that alchemy works upon. Here, the subtle light is held in the heart as the moon is held in the branches of a tree rooted in the earth. The moon opens us to intimacy, for it's the time of the secret, the secret ancient whisperings of nature, the instinctual energies that have a connection to the primordial night, knowing, the night knowing we return to in dreams, I would say. Um, what dwells here is a roundness and a connectedness to the creative organization of the world, an alignment to the life that honors aspects of creativity that need time to gestate. Mm -hmm. Our longing for meaning and for connection and for love are within these branches. The mercurial nature of this moon is fluid, transforming silence and the space for what Henri Corbon calls the mundus imaginalis, or the imaginal realm, which is centered in the heart. He places it there from Ibn Arabi's writings. It's here where one may encounter the figures and symbols of the unconscious and relate with them, hear their stories, gain the wisdom they care to share. Entering this liminal or betwixt and between space requires feminine qualities of receptivity, of being and listening rather than doing, of going into the depths of the psyche to imagine, to muse, to relate and respond. The mercurial nature of this realm is not unlike the healing wisdom of the serpent. It's a state of going into one's heart, for the heart is the place of feeling, where love comes in, where we can acknowledge and accept what we find. 
The inner world and its inhabitants are the very material of alchemy. Jung relied upon active or creative imagination to engage with the archetypal energies. And what we have as a testament to these soul journeys is not only his writings, but also the artistic renderings from the Red Book, chronicling these interactions with figures, living elements of the inner world. For in the words of Jung, psychical events are facts, are realities. And when you observe the stream of images within, you observe an aspect of the world, of the world within. This perspective creates space, and it invites what's more hidden to show itself. Accepting whatever one finds in the inner world is done not for one's own benefit, but for the whole. And this is one of the basic tenets of alchemy, is that it's always been done, as true alchemists know, for the sake of the whole. The individual may benefit, but really it's been in service to life. In this image, nature leads the human alchemist, for life is the greatest teacher. Often when we do something that we may not quite understand, it involves a space for learning and growing. And when we begin to plant a garden, and put seeds and little vegetable starts in the soil. We need patience, we need time, we need to look and make sure the soil has enough compost, enough material nutrients for things to grow. We need to be attentive, we need to learn to listen. And you learn to see what plants need water, what need more, what need less, what plants are getting, maybe the tomatoes are loving the garden because they're getting plenty of sun and yet it's a little too much for the kale. So the kale bolts which means it goes to seed right away. Well, that just shows, like nature here, the generosity, the abundance. And maybe you can take those seeds and you save them for next spring and you plant them then. And maybe you share some with your friends so they can also plant some in their gardens. But it's, it's kind of this, this learning to have a sense of connection. It is a, it's a learning of, a way to be with the soil of the earth, the ground. It's a way of learning to be with the plants and pay attention to their needs. And this is something that's not so valued in our outer culture anymore. But it's also a, a metaphor for the inner life. You need to watch and make sure you pull the weeds if something starts growing, so it doesn't overtake the vegetables. That's a process of discrimination. We're back to discrimination again. But it's also something that brings a lot of joy, because you can share the abundance that comes from this growing. And it doesn't have to be all vegetables. It can be beautiful flowers and that sage you planted just because. And then you discover it's got these beautiful flowers that the bees love to tumble around in. And pollinate things. And they make things kind of bounce and sway in their play, that divine play of life. But in this generosity of the garden, you can feel its vibrance shimmering and alive. And that's, that's the anima mundi, that's the soul sparks, the lumen nature. Alchemists throughout the ages have known the importance of following in nature's footsteps to learn the secret inherent wisdom in nature's organic organizing principle and ability to give birth out of itself. For the feminine carries the sacred substance, the soul sparks of the anima mundi within her that are the light hidden in matter the alchemists sought to release in their efforts to turn lead into philosophical gold. And by this I mean the feminine that's in both men and women, for we have each feminine and masculine parts within us. But it is nature who guides the process of transformation. She's the feminine personification of the life force we call by many different names, as we mentioned. The Shekinah of the Hebrew tradition, the great spiraling energy as Shakti of the Hindus. She is the ancient Ishtar, Astarte, Isis, the Black Madonna, and Sophia, whose name means feminine wisdom. 
So I think, I think, you know, just returning to, to this process of evolution and Lilith, just kind of staying with that image somehow. It's threading through this and, and it's still kind of evolving. But it's interesting to me that for Shoshana, the, okay, so, so there's a shofar, correct? Which is a ram's horn that gets blown and does the calling, the sounding of the ram's horn on this, this celebratory day. And as far as I understand, there are also apples dipped in honey that are eaten, which is kind of funny to me, humorous, in that it's this conundrum of this apple that was eaten in the Garden of Eden caused so much trouble, and yet it's apples dipped in honey, which is a, a golden elixir of, of bees tumbling in flowers created. It's the, that's alchemy. That's a process of refinement. That is the sweetness of life and abundance and creativity and beauty and so many things that return us to just the sensual nature of, of nature. Nature's not clean and pure and linear. Nature is kind of sticky and nature can be very fluid and moist and and very physical. It's sensual. It invites engagement. It invites tasting, feeling, really sensing. It invites a being in the physical form of the body. So just musings. But I think especially as women, for the women in the room, because we have these wombs, because we have a sacred substance within us that allows us to give birth, there is a different responsibility that we are called to, especially in this moment in time. And I don't know if anything comes of it, but I'm just kind of playing with the matter that's showing itself. So here's another image. This is Mother Nature, but in a different way. She is Mater Natura, and it's still the same. This is Mother Nature in her beautiful geometry and golden ratio of the nautilus of seashells and the centering spiral of the seeds of a sunflower's face and the unfurling arms of ferns and the patterns repeated in the swirling, spinning cosmos and reflected in the waves and waters of the living earth. Nature comes from Latin, natura, and its roots take us back to nascere, which means to give birth. So the feminine works with this sacred substance within creation. And within the heart, is a place for both men and women to be present with this tumbling, mm, turning, spiraling energy. And in a way that you know, something can be made incarnate within each of us. Something can be given a space that's life-affirming for the principle of the luminaturae, the light that's hidden in matter, the alchemist sought to liberate, to free. And it's these soul sparks that are, are really the matter of the opus. That's what alchemy seeks to liberate. And it's not other than the life animating force that, that we need to really remember and embody to return to and live. The universe is a cosmos because it has 
perfect because it is perfect and adorned with infinite beauty and living beings. This is the words of Pythagoras. It's essential to alchemy to recognize and acknowledge that just as we have souls, so too does the world. For the world is a living being. And culturally in the West, we've nearly forgotten this because it's no longer held in our consciousness. But this is changing. And I think it's due to alchemy's ability to refine and renew, revitalize life. From Middle Latin, anima means soul, vital principle. And mundi means world. For the Greeks, this was psyche to cosmo, the soul of all things. Psyche means soul, from which we get psychology, the study of soul, in combination with cosmos, which means a range of things, from a harmonious geometric arrangement, as in the organization of stars and their planetary companions, to the balanced sensibility of the appearance of things especially with respect to a feminine quality of aesthetics, with a sensitivity, for example, to dress, decoration, adornment, beauty, and sensuality, out of which comes the word cosmetics. While we each have the dynamic energies of both, as I mentioned, feminine and masculine within us, the feminine aspect relates to a quality of soul. Ancient traditions and cultures have often considered the soul feminine, and perhaps this is because of the soul's ability to create images in order to evolve. Meister Eckert says, when the soul wants to understand something, she throws out an image in front of her and steps into it. (laughs) Symbols are the language of the soul. They aren't limited like words. But then again, words have deeper meanings too. But symbols are transformative. They are shapeshifters. They are very mercurial. When they are tended, they do not remain in one state. And you can follow them in dreams in this way. You can follow a specific thread of energy in dreams where you begin with one image that then, through engaging with it, will actually take on another form. This again returns to the, what Marianne Woodman said of the feminine does not like to be concretized. She likes to keep moving. She is like the river that never appears the same twice. But soul relates to, as I mentioned, the feminine principle. And it's been been thought to be that, but it also relates to breath, noima, life. What animates. Here, um, the anima mundi is represented as containing all the elements, the ceaseless the elements in ceaseless movement um, within the one form. She's got a chameleon in one hand, which speaks to that changeable element. She's got an eagle in the other, which relates to the spiritual realm. Her eyes are at the sun and moon. Across her head are stars. On her garment are the planetary influences. From her breasts flow the milk of the Milky Way, the waters of the rivers that flow. From her mouth is the wind of inspiration and life. Her hair is the fire, the passion, the fire of the hearth, that warms the home around which we tell our stories, around which we gather for food, for nourishment. And there's something of of the life force infused by breath. In the wisdom of the sages, it's said that 
the greater the awareness of the breath, the greater the awareness of the inner life. And it's just a marvelous image that speaks to a certain harmony in life. And it's a wild engagement. It's not tame. And this image, I would say, I think it's important to remember that given the state of, of the world and the collective denial of the sacred nature of the feminine, this goes back to the garden. Here we go again. I'm returning. This happens in alchemy on the spiral. Um, you know, it's it's not just the repression of the outer feminine, which I do feel like women have an important role to play in recognizing something. It's also that that inner feminine that's been denied and needs to be brought back into consciousness. And it's it does feel like nature really needs to be redeemed by human alchemists at this time. And this would mean a returning to grace what's been disgraced, dishonored. And this is the work on the shadow in psychological terms. The need to redeem what's been abused and debased, the soul, the earth, the body, the ground of being. It's returning again and again to these rejected parts and paying attention so we can see their roots and ask for the guidance and the help to transform them into their highest potential. The process is, is one that takes perseverance and patience and real work. There's a saying I go to often when in the midst of something that's particularly challenging. It's the consent that draws down the grace. By our saying yes to life, life can respond in unexpected ways. Things can be purified by grace. In this image, it's the shadow of the feminine that contains the gold of soul and spirit and matter that unite in her being. But first, it's necessary to redeem the darkness. So this is the potential. And to reach into darkness means we must surrender our desire for a certain known outcome. You know, when I was a child, I had all these beautiful experiences with nature in communion with nature. And I was part of it. I was part of everything. I was not separate. Then life, as it can do, kind of broke me open. You know, and for a long while, I, well, I appreciated the beauty of nature. I was not a part of it in the same way. I had been wounded and I was somehow separate. And what the alchemical process does is it changes you from the inside. It changes the very structure and fabric of your being and reorganizes things in a way that moves us toward perfection not a perfection that we impose upon life. But this is a refinement on the level of the soul. It's a refinement of the substance of the soul, where it's the soul that makes the journey. So in alchemy, the wound or trauma or crisis is also a time of great potential, as we talked about with Fanny. My teacher once said in relation to alchemy, the greater the imperfection, the greater the perfection. Mm -hmm. So those who have suffered, who know pain, who have been broken open by love for love's sake, expand their understanding of acceptance, of getting down on one's knees. Mm -hmm. Rumi says there are 10,000 ways to kneel and kiss the earth. In this way of being, we come to a new sense of belonging, of community. Not just with our human community, but an expansion into the commingling of all of life. When there's a recognition that life wants to be lived, and we're not separate from life, we are a part of life, we can give that love back to life. 
and back to the images being born that will be the structure of the life to come. And then synchronicities begin to happen. And the most, mo in the most magnificent ways, as life engages us differently. Indigenous peoples have always understood this connection to the oneness of creation, but they never forgot their connection to the soul in all things. When women planted corn, they sang to the earth. When they wove baskets, they breathed prayers as they passed the grasses through their mouths to moisten them. Indigenous means born from the land. With a memory like that, it's no wonder there is a remembrance of the sacred hoop of life. In the words of Martin Shaw, modern myth maker and storyteller, what we need is a great, powerful, tremulous falling back in love with our old, ancient, primordial beloved, which is the earth herself. And this is a, a Maidu basket, a Native American Maidu basket from the West Coast. There's my mercure on the middle. There we go. <laughs> now, alchemy is a process of refinement of the light hidden in matter, and alchemists, through their work, have understood that the light of the world soul is not other than what Jung calls the innermost secret numinosum of man. In man, excuse me. The quality that, when polished, is the heart shining forth its light this energy that is not masculine or feminine, but something beyond both. Gerard Manley Hopkins puts it this way, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. If we take nature's example, we return reverence and a sacredness to life in the everyday experiences, and then spirit returns to soul. Brother Lawrence, a Carmelite monk who lived in the 1600s and wrote Practice in the Presence of God, in which he describes how to be with the sacred substances in life, said, it's a constant, intimate remembering like the breath, how to cook with God in the kitchen while peeling the carrots with, for dinner, remembering and returning always to being with the divine, how to clean with God, loving the wood while you're dusting, how to walk with God, Mother Teresa, who cared for so many, said it this way, do small things with great love. It's not what you do, but the love you put in the doing. So simple everyday acts like cooking a meal for your family or a partner or a friend, done with a consciousness of love, even doing the laundry, watering the garden, mm -hmm. done with love, it brings a different note into creation. Being present with the light of nature and life brings an evolution born from love, which is known to be the greatest power in the universe. You know, when, when people are asked what they want, they often, you know, list things, money, power, um, a good, and a nice car to attract, whatever. Whatever they think they want, a house, a new computer, the latest and greatest technology. But when it really gets down to it, I think underneath, I think what, what everybody really wants, what human beings really need, is love. There's a Persian story, that's, it's called Moshka Gosha, and, and the tale is really about building a relationship with one's higher self. And also the importance of needing enough and wanting little enough in life, and the generosity and abundance that comes out of that. Interestingly, in the words of the Beatles, all you need is love. <laughs> all of life needs love, and all of life responds to this. This is um, Dr. Masaru Emoto's work. He hid messages in water. People are familiar yeah. with his work. So the power of love and gratitude has a profound effect on the world around you. It speaks to the soul in things. And I, I think this is just a nice way of kind of conveying that message, carrying it over or across. That's the meaning of conveying. It's bridging something. It's, it's with an attitude of reverence and care that the world responds. So Dr. Emoto, for those of you who don't know his work, he has taken polluted water samples. And then when, when frozen, they kind of look globby and gray. And some of them are really almost disoriented. Yeah, and they're discolored, right? Yeah. They're, 
they're just kind of dingy in color, you might say. But then he takes the same water and he'll either, he'll have people meditate on it with a sense of love and gratitude, or he'll tape a, a piece of paper <laughs> on a jar that has love and gratitude. Or he'll have a music, a certain sound that carries a certain vibration. And what he's found is that it actually transforms the crystalline structure of water. So that this is what results when you freeze water that's and give it a crystalline shape that's had a concentration of prayers or meditations or like a, a simple mantra you know, taped to it. it. It transforms it from the very middle of its being, the very center of its being. And human beings are made mostly of water, a lot like the planet. So if you think you can do this with a small amount, how much more so could you do with... Exactly. <laughs> it's just interesting to, to wonder, to ponder. And our attitude and intention has, I mean, alchemically speaking, you can say this, but I would say in life, our attitude and intention, the way we approach nature, the way we approach life, shifts things. I like the story Marie-Louise von Franz tells, you know, Jung having been away from Bollingen for a while. And when he comes back, he's in the kitchen, and the pots and pans, lids, things, spoons, jumping off, misbehaving, mm -hmm. just general disarray. And he stops and he says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> pots and pans, I realize I've neglected you. And for this, I apologize. And it's, it's this way of being with life, in life, that acknowledges that things like to be cared for and interacted with. Mm -hmm. And they respond. And there are some things you really love and you are very attentive to and you clean your kitchen table nicely in a certain way. You know, you have, you have a way you wipe it or a certain th something you put on it to polish it. But it's those things in our life that maybe we don't pay so much attention to that we can let go of and let, let them go on into another incarnation. Maybe somebody else can use that or need it. But it's just an, a certain simple honoring that takes place. And um, so I, I'd like to say, in addition to the, that essential step of recognizing the world as an ancient living being, which is really a, you know, after our inner work, that's a primary step. Even, I think, because of the state of the world today, I don't I don't think inner work is even, I think there's a priority for us to acknowledge the living being of the world. And the second part of that is recognizing it and acknowledging that our souls are part of the world soul. We are not separate. It's in remembering where we began that we can move forward. Jung instructed Fanny to go into her heart, and it's from the state of being in our hearts that we can carry the sparks of consciousness which are not other than the lumen nature born from the inner world back. Give, and give that back. I mean, if we've done this work, if we have a consciousness of something, that's what needs to be given back to the world. We've gotten it from the world, essentially, and now we get to give it back. That's what's going to shift things. For these are the golden seeds of light. This is the image here we have. You know, now the masculine is spreading these beautiful seeds into the earth and, and things are greening and we're planting new things that will become new plants, new beginnings. These are the golden seeds of light that are the anima mundi, the generative force, that when given back becomes the healing elixir alchemy creates. And I'd say it's like, it's like a drop of the living sap that when released, it returns soul to the world and reanimates, anima, animates matter by infusing love back into the ocean of being. 
It's the drop that then becomes the concentric ripples that can transform the archetypal energies and the patterns at the heart of creation. And this is essential. Jung said archetypes determine the fate of humanity. If we're giving energy back to them, perhaps there is something that happens that stimulates, it um, um, vibrates something differently, and that's what generates transformation. And if we can, if we can shift those, those patterns that have gotten locked into something, then there's a real, I, I just feel it in my heart, there's a real potential for something, some new consciousness to come into being. And, and this is what's going to transform the outer world. I don't think we can solve the problems, the world's problems, in, with the same methods we've been trying. It's not going to work. It really is going to take this infusion of consciousness, of, of giving this luminature that we've been given back, this light back to the earth for, for that generative force to, I mean, like Masaru Emoto's work, love and gratitude creates the most beautiful crystalline structure. If we hold that in our daily lives, in the little things we do. You know, Jung says it, it takes enough individuals to be conscious, to make the transformation, to bring the change. So when we return this love, this breath of inspiration to the earth, there exists a potential to renew the material world, which is not separate from the spiritual. It's the ensoulment of being. It's the gift we've all been given as human beings. This is what Hildegard von Bingen, 12th century mystic, called the experience of the blessed greenness, the veriditas, or truth. Veriditas means truth. That surges through everything and leaves us in service to life. As she put it, to be a feather on the breath of God. And I like this quote by, by Alan Sari because I think it sums up a lot of the alchemical work as well. Strive to be the true human being, one who knows love, one who knows pain. It's our humanity that's really going to be the saving grace, I think. So maybe we take a break? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay.